Thank you for the warm welcome. I've eaten exceptionally well since arriving in Vancouver. Uh, some of the best meals I've had this year. Uh, no, no, seriously, um, wonderful. So um, uh, it's true that our, our universities have a special relationship. Our branding is red and white. Our original campus is made of concrete and is on a, a hill out in the suburbs. Uh, we have a lot in common, but seriously, um, so tonight, I'm going to try and take you through a, a journey, and this is the journey we'll take. Before I get to value uplift research, I want to get to why we are seeking to invest in things like public transport still, and why that remains important. We'll talk about why transport and land use matters. I'll go through a quick potted history, which you'll hear many similarities with the Canadian experience as I explain what's happening in Australian cities and then say why we've got jurisdictions in Australia at state government level setting up value sharing systems and getting, sorry, value capture with a new name. Value share, we're all into caring and sharing, aren't we? Um, uh, and why there's a lot of interest in the property value increases affected by the actions of the state and whether the state should take back some of that well-gotten gain, not ill-gotten gain. Okay, so, but I want to begin with why transport and land use matters. And to do that, does anyone recognise this figure? Can I just get hands up? Anyone who recognises the Monkey King? Thank you. Mostly Asiatic faces that are looking back at me. Yes, okay. Um, great. So, um, there's a book about 400 years old that I read during my PhD. It's called The Journey to the West, and it's the story of how the Buddhist um, scriptures arrived in China. And there was once upon a time a monk, a real figure, who went across to modern-day Pakistan, got these scriptures and brought them back to China. And in the retelling of that story, he had some companions on the journey. And in the retelling of that story, these companions had magical powers. And in the retelling of that story, as the, the story evolved over many, many years, um, some of the characters became so good, like the Monkey King, that they end up taking over the whole book. So if you read The Journey to the West, the monk becomes quite a small character, and the Monkey King becomes this... Anyway, at the, in the 97th of the 100 chapters... The story is of this monk who meets these magical companions and they go on a journey, they get the scriptures, they come back, and in the 97th chapter, they finally open the Buddhist scrolls. And they start reading about a monk, a monk who meets a river monster and a pig monster and a monkey king, and they go on this journey. And they're in the presence of the Buddha, and they say to the Buddha, this makes no sense. Science fiction films are 400 years in the future, and we're reading a time loop about ourselves. Um, please explain. And the Buddha says, ah, now you understand. It's these journeys and these travels that have shaped you. It's your journeys that have made you, not your destination. And of course, every road movie that you've ever watched, Thelma and Louise, uh, Little Miss Sunshine, Australia's Best, Priscilla Queen of the Desert, they all say the same thing. It's the journey that matters, not the destination. Now, I agree to a something with the ancients who wrote this book. But there's something more to that. And when we think about cities, yes, our journeys matter, but it's the accessibility that those journeys create that really also shapes our lives. Cities are shaped by three great forces. Economics, technology, and transport technology, as we'll see, is a part of that, and ideology. And cities... The, the, the fundamental elements of a transport and a land use system dictate whether people have access to the goods and the services and the jobs that they need in daily life. And that's the business of transport planning, is ensuring people have access to the goods, the services and the jobs that they need in daily life. OK. So transport and land use in Australian cities. Australia is quite a young nation. Centenary uh, Federation in 2001. Uh, you're at 150, so you're a little older than us. We got rid of the British a bit later. Um, but our cities were very small at the very time that, that we started to densify. And this new technology of the rail line and the streetcar was invented that allowed our cities to be born decentralised. 
And we built great streetcar cities. Brisbane in the 1930s was the preeminent streetcar <laughs> cities. In the war, the highest mode share for trams ever experienced probably in any city in the world was in Brisbane. Uh, Sydney claims to have been there, but on my figures, we were ahead. Um, and you can see a city that's comprised of sort of streetcars and these railways with these rail suburbs that, that were creating um, an urban form that was a transit metropolis. And that started to change. Post-war urbanisation, this is the suburb next to mine, where my house currently is. We started to go a different way. Uh, we learnt from planners in, in Britain and in America uh, the wonders of the motor car and the utopic future that was going to be wonderful for us. And we had to reconstruct the existing city to cope with the car. This was the Buchanan Report, highly influential in Australia, uh, suggesting what we needed to do to city centres, which was to give over most of the area to the car, and push the pedestrians onto these wonderful walkways where they'd be so happy that they would uh, buy a P&O cruise to go somewhere else or inebriate themselves at the bar because the city was so bloody horrible. Um, and we hired American consultants. This was the Wilbur Smith and Associates firm who did the Brisbane Transportation Study, actually a freeway plan, um, which was to re-engineer the city with a set of freeways in and through the city uh, and to remove our tram system, which we did. And we went on and did this in Australian cities. This is the Vomitron, uh, quite new. We've just spent $15 billion on new freeways in my city. Uh, and this is the Vomitron that connects them all quite close to the city centre. Um, uh, really lovely, as you can tell. Um, uh, done with toll roads. Uh, one of these roads is getting a quarter of the traffic that was predicted. Um, you know, obviously wonderful investments for the city. We re-engineered our, our housing uh, so that if aliens came from in, into, you know, galactic space and came, they would think, oh my goodness, these things are occupied by these wonderful beings called cars that get the best room in the house and are doted upon by these strange servants called humans. Um, so, you know, we've built some of the ugliest housing in the world in Australian cities, uh, some of the biggest housing as well, which is part of our unaffordability. Uh, and we've built the freeway landscape. We got rid of the, the, the old streetcars so that even much of our inner city has become much more car dependent than it ever was. And we really did build freeways in and through. We've now connected them up through the inner city with giant tunnels. Um, and we created that autopic landscape. And we started to realise the error of our ways. You know, the sustainability crisis, uh, the affordability of the car, the problem of congestion, people started clamouring for something different. We had anti-freeway revolts in our city uh, at a couple of key moments and a couple of key freeways, one that went through koala habitat. You know what koalas are? Little cute, little, yeah, they're almost, you know, we, we almost bulldoze their last great remaining territory in Brisbane. So um, we took an idea from Ottawa and we, we, we took the Ottawa-style busway and improved it a little, but we stole it. We clearly stole it. Um, and um, we sent a delegation of, of, of politicians and others to Ottawa, and, and we've created some of the world's best quickway model busways, and they've been very, very effective. Um, um, bus patronage has gone up a lot, but it did cannibalise the rail system, as you can see on the far right-hand side. And then when we started pricing fares too high, people have started abandoning, oh, and building $15 billion worth of uh, freeways, people started abandoning uh, public transport in recent years. Another innovation uh, to get people moving back into the inner city, we used transport as part of a process to do what we called urban renewal, gentrification in the inner city. And we, we looked to cities around the world who've used urban water transit very effectively. So we've built a river bus system, similar to your sea bus system, uh, but it has 23 stops, because ours is better. No, um, um, but, uh, but very, very successful. And it has led to something we would call ferry-oriented development. So 
people are saying, yes, we want more public transport. But we have now got a, a third group in Australian cities who are saying, no, no, we shouldn't start to invest in public transport now because of the new sharing economy. Sharing, sharing's so wonderful, it's so great. It's the word of the year, isn't it? Um, okay, so um, some people say we're all gonna collectivize and get into car clubs, and especially when autonom autonomous vehicles come, we'll all just buy uh, Google's you know, um, club goods rather than our own car. Um, the story of car sharing in Australia thus far is that 0.001% of the population seem to want to do it. Um, so I'm not really sure whether that's going to take off. Uh, then there's the so-called sharing of Uber, uh, almost zero, not almost zero, but very, very few trips in Australian cities are thus far true sharing if you take the driver out of the uh, equation. Um, car occupancy rates for Uber is actually quite low in Australian cities. Uh, they're really taxi-like services. Uh, and when we look at sharing as a whole, when I say that Australians don't want to do it, this is what's happening with um, journeys to work, car driver only uh, versus car passengers. And car occupancy rates in Australian cities are plummeting. We're, we're getting down to close to one. Uh, and if we could, we would go below one. And guess what? We're inventing a technology that will allow us to go below one. We'll soon have empty cars on our streets, hooray! Um, clogging up everything, uh, which is one of the predictions most of us have. And the only versions of sharing where people are truly trying to do sharing, which is trying to do something like public transport, um, private microtransit without public subsidy, they've gone broke. Um, bridge collapsed and died um, and plummeted into the, uh, the sea below them. Um, uh, and who would have thought that you know, IT entrepreneurs who've never run transit systems would actually uh, be better than transit operators. Um, anyway, <sighs> so now we find ourselves in Australian cities at this funny point. We keep producing these wonderful plans that say, we want our cake and we want to eat it too. We want to appeal to suburban voters who think that the answer to the problems of the car is more car. The improvement to that flyover, a widening of that road that will simply induce more of what we've got. Uh, we've got a big fight at the moment over a, uh, and a big investment we're making in a, a southern corridor where the answer is to not widen the road but to extend one of these busways. The busway in the inner city of Brisbane, which we did instead of widening the freeway in the inner area, carries more passengers than the entire six lanes of freeway. Extend the bloody thing, get people out of their cars. That's the answer. But no, the people, the voters in that southern region think that the answer is one single car lane extra. They're mad. Anyway, so we're in this era of what we call balanced transport planning, trying to do it all. Build lots of freeways and, and build new, new systems. We're going to convert our busway because it's been too successful, uh, in the first one, into a rubber-tired metro of some, some description. So this leads to a big problem, and that problem is how do we pay for stuff? And this is where Anthony and I are currently collaborating. We've got a paper coming, uh, just come out on this first issue of fuel taxes. You might have noticed that uh, electric vehicles are starting to be quite popular, and they don't pay petrol taxes. And so if your main way of funding highways traditionally is petrol taxes, what do you do when you don't have petrol taxes? So there's all sorts of people looking at different ways to deal with that. Some people say we should just and some jurisdictions are doing that. But there's all sorts of issues in, in the road space for how we pay for that. But there's a similar big issue in the public transport space. Fares do not cover near anything near what public transport systems cost. But those systems are responsible for helping the knowledge economy. The, the knowledge economy of Vancouver would not survive without SkyTrain and those investments made in the past. The city simply could not get the workers to this downtown. You simply would not be able to move those numbers of people without that infrastructure today. You need to subsidise it. And so there's interest in alternative funding and financing. 
And a big part of that is this interest in property value schemes. And so I'm now going to turn to the, meat, the, the, the main bread and potatoes of the presentation, value uplift. So I hope I've helped us get to that point without too many jokes. OK. So people get really confused with what value uplift is. I'm going to try and do it as simply as possible. OK? Your properties or the property you rent, think about that residential unit, condo. You could use the word condo here, yeah? OK. Um, whatever it is you live in, think of that space. And you think of the value of that residential dwelling. There is an intrinsic land value of some description. You know, that land is worth something down on the ground or the airspace. It has a, an intrinsic value. There are then another set of values that are added to that that comprise the total property value. So you have some that are due to the green stuff is because the landowner has built something there. And then maybe added a new patio and a, you know, a hot tub so they could get eaten by a bear. I've heard horrific stories about living in Vancouver, sorry. Um, um, but whatever it is you've added as an investment in your, on your property, um, that's your profits, right? And in a sense, we would say that the landholder, you know, if you improve your property, you should gain that value back. You should, you should recoup the value of that investment. That's fair, right? But there are other things that happen to your property, like the state giving it a rezoning. So once upon a time, it was just zoned as residential A, shall we call it, uh, for low-rise development. You can't build apartments or anything here. You can't, therefore, make a lot of rent out of that square meterage of land. But one day, the government comes along and says, we're going to rezone that for some much higher and, and more profitable uses. And suddenly the land is worth a heck of a lot more than what it was the day before. What have you done as a landholder to increase that property value? Did you, you know, what did, what did you really do? Did you work hard? Did you do something amazing for, for society? No, you did nothing. So it's, it's um, there is a, a, an ideological argument that the state should be able to reclaim some of the value back from that rezoning, to, and in particular to help pay for infrastructure to service that development. And that's a reasonable argument. That's a fair and just way forward, I would think. And it's similar with infrastructure investment. So we've got people in Western Sydney who've got a new train station built to a quite sizable parcel near them who made about $20 million Canadian dollars in, uh, our dollars are about one to one, so about, yeah, about 20 million Canadian dollars simply from the fact that the state decided to locate a rail station quite near their property. And what did they do? Did they do something brilliant for society? Have they sold goods and services? Have they, no, they just squatted on the land, a, a very ancient Australian tradition. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think there's a reasonable argument that the state should be able to take some of that well-gotten gain and say, well, we'll have a bit of that back, thank you very much. And so there's a debate about this and at what level and what, what, what's the appropriate measure, but most economists would say that that's a reasonable thing to consider. And then how would you do what they call value capture? And there's a whole set of options that exist. These are just some of them. Um, so the ones that you probably do already, you probably already require developers to, to build bike parking at their development, to put a bus stop at their, in their new subdivision if there is such a thing, and to pay for that basic kind of infrastructure. And they might have to pay a headworks charge for the roads and for other things that exist. That's quite common. There are also what are called betterment levies, and these have a mixed history. In Australia, we've used them three times. The Sydney Harbour Bridge was part paid for by a betterment levy on North Sydney residents who were suddenly linked in to that significant employment node uh, by that bridge. And so that was a levy that was a special levy only for a few years that, that 
was added to their taxes, their, their residential charges, to help pay for it. You have broad brush land taxes, so you will all have a city land tax of council rates or something for the city of Vancouver or Surrey or wherever it is you may live. But there's also the option of a provincial land tax that would help claim some of this. Most economists would say that's the best way to go. There's also air riots. So in Hong Kong, they're very favourable about that. 20 minutes? OK. Um, I'm right on time. So uh, where you, you build a station, but you sell off the, the development rights to a developer like Li ka Shing or someone like that to develop a very large property on top of the station. Uh, or you do it in joint development, where the rail authority actually becomes a developer, works with the private sector and, and develops property and uses those profits to help pay for the stations and other things that they developed. And then the Americans are very fond of this thing, where you package up future tax increases in taxes that will happen because of this um, new, new infrastructure. You put it into a collateralised debt obligation or one of these fancy instruments. You sell it as a bond or something else on the, on the international markets uh, and therefore you get financing. Australian cities are not doing this. We're awash in finance. There are banks over the world willing to, you know, give us finance for anything. Um, it's crazy out there at the moment. So there's no problem with finance. So that's, that's curing a problem that Australian cities don't have. So we're not, we're not looking at any of that. Okay. So if we want to build new busways, if we want to have more city cats, if we want to modernise one of the worst run um, heavy rail systems in the world, uh, we didn't even have enough drivers to run the trains recently. Ah, and this is on the Gold Coast. New transport of delight, the new Gold Coast light rail. Australia's most boring success story. Uh, it's been very solidly successful without being a spectacular um, Game changer. Uh, a new line haul um, system for a city that grew up around the car because it was only born in the 1960s. But how do we pay for all that? So um, people are saying we should look at property uplift. But the problem is, if we're going to do betterment levies or things like that, when does uplift occur? Does it happen early? Uh, you know, when, when government announces... A, uh, a new project? Does it only happen when they make a financial commitment? Or does it only happen when you start actually constructing the thing, or even after mature operations? When is the timing of uplift? A lot of debate in the literature about this. And when we looked at the Gold Coast light rail, people were saying, well, there may not be any effect at all. Our boffins in Canberra, do you use the term boffins? Um, um, Eggheads, squareheads, uh, bureaucrats. Yeah, sorry to the bureaucrats in the room. I, I, used, to be, I used to work in Canberra as one of those people, so um, self-inflicted. OK, um, but, but they, they did a quick test just looking at a short slice of data and said there doesn't seem to be any impact at all. Property prices might not have changed at all, and this was widely reported. And we were like, what? Mm, don't think so. Because um, we knew, not just anecdotally, we knew from our developer friends what had really gone on. So we were like, we don't, we don't believe that. So um, we went to go and start having a look at that. The other issue was what was the shape of uplift? So I've just mentioned four modes of transport, heavy rail, light rail, busways, which are a very different beast that service a large area with this through routing model. The bus peels off the busway and goes off into the suburbs. You don't have to interchange. So what does that look like? And for city cats, what is the kind of, is it a localised effect or is it a, a wider area? No one knew. So when we started saying we should have value capture schemes, um, industry was saying, yeah, that's great, but what does the uplift look like? So we've progressed quite a number of studies to look at this. So this is the longitudinal question. When do things happen? And we decided we would go back even further than almost anyone's looked before. For the Gold Coast Light Rail, we would actually look at when the very start, the very first planning studies ever commenced, which were well before construction, and see whether there was even effects 
way back then. I'm not going to go into the mathematics so much. If anyone is keenly interested in the mathematics, I would be very pleased to send you our papers and talk to you about the differences between a difference in differences model and a geographical weighted regression and a longitudinal geographical weighted regression. Uh, for everyone else I'll, today, I'll, I'll, I'll just stick to the headlines. But yes, we used some technical geospatial data um, from, uh, on property records, compiled it with a heap of data sets kindly provided by our state and provincial authorities in a similar way to what SFU works with its local partners and crunched some numbers. So this is the Gold Coast Light Rail. And the bit we were looking at was the blue line, which I actually call the Griffith University Light Rail. Uh, where the Commonwealth Games are is mostly, uh, in a couple of weeks, time, a few, about eight weeks time, uh, is mostly on this corridor. The athletes' village is at my university. So uh, when, when you see them warming up or whatever on the training tracks or training in the pool, before going to the venue for the, for the competition. It will all be at my university. Uh, and we looked way back to 1998 when the first um, uh, study happened. We got data for the 1996 for property prices. And we got these snapshots, data for property values in 96, 2002, 2006, 2011, 2016. And we did the model. And what it tells you is basically the differences between a control area and uh, your intervention area, shall we say. So the intervention area was where the light rail went in, and we had a control area. And that looked like this. So there's the, the area where the stations are. And we looked at a kind of, I think it was an 800 metre buffer around them. And then we took the next section around those, and it's not perfect, but uh, it's the best we could do at the time. Uh, we're now playing around with different buffers, uh, different control areas uh, on the coast, but we're getting similar results. So key thing, the model fit was pretty good, um, so that's all good. Property prices went up generally for both areas, as we would have expected, because property values have been going up on the Gold Coast. That's all fine. Uh, and we did capture uh, a difference between the, cat, cap, uh, the catchment and the control area. Okay? And it was quite significant. And what's really noticeable is property prices went up really early. Developers got wind of the planning and immediately started pre-positioning. They were not stupid. Quite quickly, they worked out where likely station locations were going to be, and they moved. And the price of the properties in those areas moved with them. Some of them started land banking, and only now are acting on those land banks, um, some three, four years after the infrastructure has been built. The fastest period of accelerated growth was when the financial commitment was made by the federal government. This was, they actually got some federal government money. That, that, and when the contracts were signed, this was going to happen. So before construction actually began, that's when the greatest increase in property values occurred. And then there were more modest increases after that. But most studies of value uplift have really only captured those latter parts. And they've often found about a 10% um, property value increase above the control areas. That's not what we found. That's what the, the study by Cameron Murray on the Gold Coast Light Rail found. It's not what we found. We found about a 30% increase in property values. And there was a sweet spot. There was a sweet spot about, about 100 to 400 metres from the station. So within 100 metres, our hypothesis is there's a bit of nuisance that's come with that station. You know, um, there's not much crime in Australian cities, but maybe just a little bit of nuisance from that sort of stuff. Uh, noise. The light rail's pretty quiet, but, you know, you're still on... Uh, some of it's in, on an arterial road that's still busy. There's, you know, it's n maybe not that nice. 100 to 400 metres, within a five-minute walk, you get all the accessibility, none of the nuisance. Right, so you know where to buy now when you hear about a, a new station. Um, 
uh, and there was a lesser effect, 400 to 800 metres. OK. Ah, as I should have showed you on this slide. Um, and look, it's lumpy and bumpy, not always. Um, property prices actually fell uh, quite close in that 100 metre mark when it was announced, because people thought the construction effects were coming. All right? And I understand that, because there's going to be nuisance through the construction that only happens in that 100 metre area. So, hmm. OK. So what about the busways? Busways, very different beast. When we looked at the busways, they have a much more dispersed um, effect. Uh, and so they actually cover quite a clouded area. It's not a walk-up catchment like light rail, which is a much more localised effect. They actually affect a much broader area. Um, the, the busway at the north was very new at the time this had been... Uh, this, this is a geographical weighted regression. And we didn't see much effect out of the few stations in the north that are part of that. But this southern, su southeastern busway was having quite a cloud effect over quite a large distances. You know, that's a, that's a three mile section. So, um, you know, quite, quite large areas that were being affected. Um, but for every 100 metres closer to a BRT station, we were finding a house price increase. And the ferries had a much more localised effect. So when we looked at the ferries, and there's 23 stops, the biggest effects were around the stations with the greatest redevelopment potential. It's where the rezoning was working with the investment in ferry infrastructure to create ferry-oriented development. When the planning was working in concert, that's where the greatest uplift was happening. So was it really that, or was it, the, was it really the ferry, or was it the rezoning? Hard to tease those two apart. Hard to tease those two apart. But, again, um, for every 100 metres that you got closer to the ferry stop, you got about a 4% increase. So people were very happy to pay to be near a ferry. The ferry infrastructure is really cheap. We subsidise these things at the same rate as our buses, and the infrastructure for them 23 terminals, They're nothing like you. You've got these beastly big terminals with multi-doors and we've got tiny little dinky things in our river. So um, very, very cheap. And of course, the road's free. It's free. There's no, you don't even have to re-asphalt. It's great. Um, OK. Now, so jurisdictions in Australia have been saying, right, the time is right. We now have enough data. We're going to move. And the first group that went to move was in Sydney. Uh, the New Transport for New South Wales worked for a long time on developing a value capture model. And they hired consultants. They, uh, they worked up a pretty good model for what is called the Parramatta light rail. And then someone leaked it. We don't know who. We don't know why. But I'll tell you that 17 bureaucrats were sacked. And the scheme seems to have died a death. This is potent political stuff. And it, if you are going to bring in any pretty much of a betterment levy or anything else, it's effectively a new tax. And we live in a, a, an age where taxes are anathema. Even if they're replacing other taxes, like fuel taxes, we're going to have to move to something else. Uh, but new taxes is an anathema. So um, when this article came out, uh, all hell broke loose. And yeah. So final thing to say, what does all this mean for housing affordability? I spent some time thinking about this since arriving here, because uh, in all my conversations with people, property prices seem to be a pretty strong Conversational point here is everyone waiting for their little rate information in about four days' time that tells you how much your land is valued at and therefore how much you're going to have to pay in, in council charges, right? Those of you who are landowners here, yeah, you're all, yeah, in four days? Yeah, good luck. Okay, um, so my answer to this is yes, there are implications. If you, if you put in... Uh, particular types of, of development controls of any sort, 
you can deflect development to other locations. You can bankrupt developers, as some of the tax increment financing schemes have in the US, where they were poorly thought, thought through. Uh, you can, sorry, and you can bankrupt the local government where poor, poorly thought through schemes exist. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why you would want to be careful with what you do and careful with how you design a scheme. But the more important question is, what are we funding? So there are urban economists like Ed Glazer, um, who's put out a very influential book called Triumph of the City, in which he says, we need to invest in the knowledge economy. We need to give transport investments that, give, you know, the, that attract the creative class into these inner city hubs, because that's the engine of the future. And some wealth might trickle and spill down into the outer suburbs eventually. Everyone will be happy. But we've got to do that. And I'm like, oh, are we just building transport of delights for, there's a lovely Australian term for this I won't use, but, but for, for, for wealthy snobs in the inner city and the young equivalent of that, the young IT worker crowd, entrepreneurial IT worker crowd. Um, is that what we're really building our city for? And there are examples all around the world you can see where there have been spectacular failures trying to build those kind of things. I went and visited the Nanjing light rail recently. Transport disaster. Just, oh my god. And then you go and see Crossrail in London. This new um, east-west link that is linking some of the poorest suburban hinterlands into the knowledge economy and has much better socio-spatial equity component to it. And chalk and cheese as investments. Both that work for that knowledge economy, but both are very different in the socio-spatial equity outcomes that will be achieved. And I think, therefore, that's the question. What are the socio-spatial equity issues and what is the transport justice outcome that we will have? And I will leave it there. I think I've spoken uh, pretty much on time.